Hello, everyone. Wherever you are joining us in the world and whatever time zone you're in, we're so glad that you've come to hear about enfranchising media audiences and how we can limit the effects of polarization in our media discussions. My name's Ryan Heath. I'm senior editor at Politico and the author of our Global Insider newsletter and podcast. And we have three illustrious panelists joining us for this session. The first, uh, Professor Mary B. McCord, who is Executive Director of the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection at Georgetown Law. Thank you for joining, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here today. Then we have Jen White, host of NPR's 1A, a program with such phenomenal reach that it's got around 4.5 million listeners on over 440 stations nationwide. Uh, it's an honor to have you here, Jen. It's my pleasure. And last but not least, Ravi Agrawal, who's one of my favorite people to have dinner with, but when he's not eating, he serves as editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy Magazine. Welcome, Ravi. Pleasure to be on. Well, let's dive in. I wanted to start with the thought that there's a lot of fear, which drives a lot of anger in global democratic political discussion today. And I wanted your reflections on where the balance lies for reporters and editors, both in reflecting and managing those political dynamics. Uh, Mary, do you want to kick us off? Well, you have two other reporters and editors on besides me, although I do have a journalism degree before I, I went to law school. I, you know, I think one of the challenges, and I don't know if this directly addresses your question, is that we're in such a tenuous situation. I focus on the U.S., although I've been involved in, you know, international law in the past, national security in particular. But we're in such a situation where the role of the press and of journalists and editors, you know, is normally to be completely unbiased, not putting your thumb on the scale and just staying neutral. And I think that, you know, the question to my mind is that in this fragile situation we're in with threats to democracy and the platforms, you know, social media, as well as other journalistic Journal, true journalistic platforms being misused for disinformation, what is the role of journalists and editors in actually trying to protect democracy? Is there a place to sort of put the thumb on the scale for accurate information, rejecting falsehoods and protect, protecting democracy? And to my mind, there is, but I'm very curious about what my fellow panelists say about that. Jen, how do you manage it? You've got people all across the country depending on you. So how do you strike that balance and, and keep us on an even democratic keel? So I think one of the things we have to be really careful about, and, and we think about it a lot on 1A, is what does it really mean to be neutral? Um, does neutral mean giving equal weight to science and um, misinformation? Is that neutrality? Does that serve our audience? Um, does it mean giving equal weight to a lie about a stolen election and what we know happened? If you just talk to secretaries of states across the country um, and other election experts who say, actually, no, this was not just a free and fair election. It was actually pretty calm. <laughs> it was very organized. Um, so we don't think about it so much through that lens of, of neutrality so much as, are we telling the truth? Are we telling the truth? And one of the questions we ask ourselves, it's almost a, a medical approach to the work is, are we doing harm? I, I really approach this work with the first do no harm uh, mindset. And whether or not we're serving listeners by saying, hey, these are all just ideas that are out there and giving those ideas equal weight or being very clear about what is data-based, what is scientific, what is truthful. And, and I think it feels like the, the scales have shifted a bit or, or that the way we measure that has shifted. And, and I think it has in a way um, after the last or during the last presidency, we've had to do some real critical thinking in our newsrooms about what, what neutrality really means and also whether neutrality ever really served journalism and, and the people who rely on it. So it's an ongoing conversation, though. It's, it's, it's something that we have to remain in conversation. In our, we have to remain in that conversation in our newsroom. We can't treat it as if it's this stagnant thing because it is very much, very much alive in the public discourse right now. Picking up on that, Ravi, how has the conversation evolved in your newsroom? Well, a fair bit over the years. Um, <clears throat> you know, foreign policy is nonpartisan. We publish 
both opinion and news. Um, um, we publish stuff from the left and the right. And of course, we're global. 50% um, of our audience is um, outside of America. Um, and, you know, it, it follows then that much of what we cover is, is, is stories from around the world. Um, you know, I want to riff off of what Jen was saying in terms of, you know, neutrality being this sort of tough thing to sort of figure out and triangulate and instead um, centering more one's efforts around truth, but also transparency. I think, you know, especially given the role of tech platforms over the last few years, where you can have a platform that uh, promotes, you know, um, articles or video from sources that have an agenda on the left or the right or whichever end of the spectrum, or it could be pure disinformation. I think our role um, uh, as journalists is to make sure that there is a very high degree of transparency in terms of what we do, who funds us, uh, what kind of model we have, who's writing for us, what that person's conflicts of interest may or may not be, uh, who that person represents. As much information as we can give readers and viewers, that's where we give them the tools to be able to make decisions for themselves. You know, it's important to not, especially for, for those of us that run uh, magazines and, and media organizations that are trying to not um, provide just the truth or whatever that means, but to, you know, provide information that is clearly labeled. Um, I think that's the biggest service that we can do um, in terms of letting viewers make educated, informed decisions. That's a nice bridge into a point Jen was making or, or touching on about serving the audience and how we best do that. Uh, and I wanted to sort of dive into a bit of the tension between giving an audience what they want or what they think they want and what they need to know and whether any of us can be in a position to, to make that judgment for them. And I say that because an algorithm obviously thinks it knows best for its audience. Uh, serving our audience is our mantra at Politico, but who is our audience? It's probably a fairly elite group of people compared to the total American or global population. And there can be barriers to the audience accessing that information in terms of what is charged for accessing the information. Um, maybe uh, since you gave me the inspiration, Jen, I'll, I'll flick it back to you about what are some clues for serving the audience? Oh, that's such a that's such a big a big question. And you know, when we talk about public radio, where I've spent my my career. Um, the question for me has, has never been so much about what does our audience want to hear um, or even what they need to hear. It's about what can we share with our audience to help them think critically about issues that impact them, even if they don't know <laughs> those issues impact them. Um, how do we build a more informed audience, regardless of, of what that audience looks like, the demographics. Um, I think public radio is known for having a certain demographic, um, older, white, highly educated. Um, but if I'm only building conversations around that audience or what I think or assume that audience wants to know, I'm, I'm not really serving them. And I'm also making assumptions about what they might want or need to know. We had a very interesting conversation on the show um, in the past week about the renaming of, uh, of historical landmarks um, to remove a slur commonly used to refer to Native American women. And we got so many comments from people who said, I never even knew that was an offensive term. You don't know until you don't know, until you know, until someone tells you. Um, and so, so that's part of what I think about is, is where, where are there conversations that haven't been had? How do we move conversations forward? But also thinking beyond our audience, who's a part of that conversation? We're big believers on one aid of, of, not having conversations that don't include the people we're talking about. So nothing about us without us. That's just <laughs> at a baseline. And I think that does two things. One, it introduces people to voices they don't often hear in media, but it also expands what we mean when we're talking about our audience. 
right? It's not just the people listening to the show on a given day, it's the people who are also engaging in the conversation as participants. Um, and that's really important to me, it's important to our team. So I, I think, you know, when we start talking about audience demographics, we have to be really careful that, that we're not making these assumptions about what they want and need. And we're fortunate to be in a position where our audience gets to drive a lot of our conversations, but we also make the decision to push <laughs> our audience to places sometimes that may not be, may not be comfortable. Um, but we think that's our responsibility too. How about you, Ravi? Uh, transparency is clearly relevant there. Is there anything beyond transparency you think the audience needs? Well, I think, uh, you know, on, on the issue of, you know, the, the tail wagging the dog or the other way around, I think there is a danger to assuming that one's audience is static as well, because I think, first of all, people change. So you may think that a population or a demographic in a country or your particular audience might feel a certain way, um, let's say about democracy or communalism or say gay marriage, well, their views may evolve. Um, and so, you know, leaving room open for that is, is so important in terms of what we do. Um, we, I don't think, we're not politicians. It's, it's not our role to sort of take people somewhere necessarily. I think our role is to shed light on issues, is to bring perspectives forward and also to open conversations to new audiences. So, as I said, individuals change, but also your demographics and your audiences change as well. I mean, if you look at the average age of uh, a cable TV viewer uh, in the United States, um, you know, Fox News's median age is probably, you know, around about 65 to 70 at this point. That's not static. It's, it's going to change. Those dem demographics are going to change as well. So there's a real danger, I think, in, in, in overthinking who are we serving. Um, and I think as journalists, again, uh, the higher calling of why are we doing this? You know, what is the aim of putting this information out there? Is it a good discussion to have? Should be more of a North Star uh, than simply audience demographics. Mary, I wanted to bring you in on a slightly different note. Uh, and it's around the thought that the digital revolution has dismantled so many barriers in media world. Anyone can be a publisher to the whole world now, at least at some scale. But that process, that very rapid process, also blew up a lot of useful safeguards that took hundreds of years of professionalization in journalism to, to create. Uh, and then I wonder whether it's now up to the journalists that remain to fix that, or the digital platforms to fix that, or does at some point government need to intervene. And that's very tricky because government can very easily get this wrong in the media world. I think these are really um, critical questions and there's no perfect answers because on the one hand, it's very, um, uh, you know, fostering of expression and First Amendment rights to, you know, expand the number of people who are able to partake in that sort of process, not just of journalism, but of making their views known. On the other hand, what we've seen is, I guess, I'm, I, you know, for lack of a better word, the abuses of that, not only by those who would say, well, I'm a journalist because I'm a blogger, I'm a journalist because I, you know, d do this or that type of thing that, you know, is very, looks very different than traditional journalists, but more importantly, because people, whether they're calling themselves journalists or they're just taking advantage of the of the ability to get their thoughts and views out widely to an immense audience at really no cost, almost no cost at all, as long as they have a Wi-Fi connection and some sort of, um, you know, electronic device, uh, means there's just almost no policing of it, right? We've got, we've got uh, people spreading disinformation, and I've just almost quit calling it that now and just call it lies because we, we I think we started out being very gentle and saying misinformation, then we sort of involved the disinformation. But right now what we're seeing is just outright lies about really important issues of public concern, not only about the 2020 election, you know, the lies about that continue and in fact have been amped up by elected officials and people disgracefully who have, you know, see political gain out of that, but lies about COVID, lies about masking, lies about critical race theory, lies about so many, many things. Um, and the problem then is that 
who, you know, who is listening to these people? Who is consuming this? And to go back to the last uh, responses about audience, right now it's, you know, buyers, buyer can choose whatever, uh, you know, source of information they want and consume only what they want. And so even though journalists are trying to maybe push their audiences, some, not all, some are perfectly happy with the audience they have and they want to, you know, keep preaching to that audience, but some, and I would put both of my co-panelists in this category, um, are really trying to make sure that they're giving people what they need for critical thinking, but that's too rare. And, and I think that's one of the problems is where people are consuming their news these days um, includes sources that are, you know, not reputable, uh, spreading lies, not real journalists, yet maybe put a journalism label on themselves. I mean, um, I also just one last comment. I think the line between news and sort of commentary and opinion has gotten increasingly blurred over the years. Um, used to be very clear, and to, and to Ravi's transparency point, you know, commentary, whatever. But we see it seeping in, and I think it happened first on, you know, the cable news stations, you know, the the, the visuals that, that where it just seemed like programs that used to be basically about news and having expert guests now have very long opening monologues, like 15 minutes out of an hour before you even get to the guests. And, and that's all. And maybe everyone understands its commentary, but I think that evolution has come uh, over the course of time to, to, you know, not be completely clear that, that this is not, I'm not just delivering you news right now. I'm delivering commentary as well. Uh, Jen, let's, let's bring you back in and maybe add in a, a sub-clause to that question um, about whether uh, a, there is a role for government when it comes to very extreme or politic uh, viol incitement of violence sort of language, that sort of material. It, it's so tricky because I think, as, as Mary said, rightfully, it, it's so easy, or maybe you said it, it's so easy for, for government to get it wrong. But we're talking about right now during a pandemic, what are truly life or death decisions people are making, not just about their health, but about the health of people around them, the health of people who are vulnerable, children who are too young to be vaccinated, people who are immunocompromised. And when there aren't guardrails that hold people with enormous platforms accountable in any way for spreading misinformation and presenting that information as if it is news or science or in any way reputable. We have to get serious as a country about what, or, or just be clear-eyed about what we're willing to sacrifice. If we are willing to sacrifice lives so that these people can have their platform and, and they have carte blanche to say what they want. Let's, let's be honest about that. Um, we, we have depended on the free market and capitalism to be the corrective in this space. If you don't wanna listen, then just turn it off. If you don't wanna listen, don't subscribe to this podcast or cancel that subscription. And that is an option, but because of the way media has splintered now and because of the fact that people can set up their little studio at home and find another platform to, to spread this information, the market is not going to correct, they're not, it's not going to correct for this kind of spread of, of misinformation, it's just not. So I think there has to be a place where government sets it, steps in not as a counter to free speech, but to say there's accountability, to say that there are guardrails because we're talking about life or death. This is, this the pandemic is, I mean, we're at how many hundreds of thousands of people just in the US alone now who have died as a result of this virus. And then when we look at political discourse and this increase in, in incitement to violence, we're hearing now, you know, people being urged to carry weapons to polling stations. I mean, it's, I, I, I don't know exactly what the answer is and what those guardrails look like, but if we're willing to say no 
we don't want guardrails. We're just going to let it be and people can say what they want. Then I think we have to be honest about what we're willing to sacrifice to have that be the standard. Mm -hmm. uh, Ravi, the U.S. obviously has its uh, constitutional history. That's a big factor uh, in this discussion here. Uh, do you see guardrails operating in other ways in other political traditions that you come across at foreign policy? Um, no, not as many as I would like. I mean, one example I could bring up is, you know, in terms of government taking action is just basic regulation in terms of, you know, where commentary is allowed and where it isn't, um, where you have to just stick with the news and where you can, can range beyond that. So if you look at the United Kingdom, for example, which has Ofcom, which regulates broadcast uh, TV, um, I'm not saying it's perfect, of course, but, but at the very least, they, they do have rules around where you're allowed to be partisan and where you need to stick to the news. I think that's something that other countries should explore as well, even though it would be very politically difficult uh, in many countries to put stuff, to put measures like that in place. But more broadly, the conversation I do wish um, countries around the world have, and this is common um, because of the internet really, is discussions around both digital literacy and media literacy. So. Digital literacy, especially in countries that have had explosions of people coming online um, through smartphones, uh, think of a country like India, where, you know, three, four hundred million people have come online in the last five or six years, um, in large part because of smartphones, which for them are their first computers, their first TVs, their first MP3 players, uh, and so much more. Um, there should be some regulation in place to make sure that as people are spending money on smartphones, um, there's a tax of some sort to ensure that there is uh, an allocation of money towards digital literacy so that people understand that these are devices that can be misused to understand you know, what it means when a message has been forwarded 5,000 times, but you don't know what its source is. Um, that's something that I think every government around the world needs to do more on. Similarly, media literacy, um, you know, the reason why so many of us can, can be gullible um, in terms of, you know, falling for myths or disinformation, in terms of not being sure um, where the news is coming from, who's funding it, uh, what the agenda behind it might be. We need media uh, literacy starting in schools. Um, we need regulation that would force um, media companies to disclose much more clearly where their funding comes from, um, you know, and how they're dividing news and opinion. So I think those are all conversations that I, I hear of in academic circles, but not enough um, in uh, government circles, in part because it would be very difficult to pull off any of these reforms. Well, let me make it even more personal then and uh, allow us to end on a note where I check in on how regularly each of you reassess where you get your information from, what you do or don't do to uh, deal with the deeply formed habits that you've developed over a lifetime of, of consuming media. And I'll, I'll put you in the hot seat first, Ravi. Um, so how my consumption has changed. I mean, I, I like to read, I mean, and it's my job to, to read widely. So um, I'm probably not the best example of this, but I, I like to read things I disagree with. Uh, that's how I learn. Um, I like to look at um, media in other languages. Um, that gives me a, a wider span and scope. Uh, I, I'm lucky that I grew up in India. I speak Hindi and, and Urdu, and I do follow the media um, in, in those languages as well. Um, but mostly, I think, uh, you know, the ability to cross-compare. I think that that is something that, again, um, I'm able to do out of sheer privilege and the fact that it is my job to do so. Um, but, but over the last few years, um, you know, where my consumption has evolved is to think more closely about who's funding uh, sources that I have been looking at in the past and how that's changing. Uh, I especially like, of course, public funding models um, and subscription models because I think uh, they tend to be the cleanest. How about you, Jen? Yeah, I would echo everything Ravi said. And if I can first just build a little bit on his previous answer about media literacy, because I think he touched on something really important. In the U.S., we have uh, a lack of both civic education now in schools. And I think media literacy has to be part 
of that civic education. Both go hand in hand now in this country, and I think globally as well. And if I could push for for one thing of the many things, getting that civic education back in classrooms, because I think we're all of an age where we probably had that class growing up. And all of the younger people I know now, including some of our producers, are like, what's a civics class? So that would be something I'd be really excited to, to see. Um, and and the transparency piece of what Ravi has focused on for so much of, of his time is, is part of that me- media literacy. But an organization isn't being transparent about how they approach the work. That's clue number one, that uh, maybe I need to be cautious about this source as being a reliable one. Um, but I'm also like Robbie in that I, I am fortunate in that I get to read a lot. Um, I get to, to read a wide swath of information. Um, and and it's, it's interesting in that coming to a national show from a local show, um, it was, I was doing a lot of reading a lot of national coverage, national politics. And what I realized is like, uh, I need to go back to reading local papers because there's a certain type of coverage you're getting at that local paper, local digital source, a news level that's outside of the beltway, that isn't horse race politics, but really connects the dots between a policy and how that policy affects community. What's happening in a state legislature that we need to be keeping an eye on because it's actually happening in a lot of state legislatures. So probably over the past year, I've refocused my attention more to those local news services because they're, they're, you can glean so much about what's happening at the national level by looking at it through that lens. And it's stuff that gets glazed over a lot of times in national politics. So that's, that's how my reading has been shifting over the past year or so. If I could choose another session to focus on, I would do one just on local journalism and the trauma it's gone through and the effect that has on our democracy. Uh, Mary, as someone who's trained as a journalist but doesn't have to be a journalist for a living, uh, w- w- what do you do to, to keep media literate? Yeah, you know, I do take consume most of my news from print materials. I mean, it's digital these days, but uh, but NPR is like literally my favorite. I'm never in the car anymore, though, which is when I always listen to NPR. So sometimes I just need to go drive around so I can turn NPR on. Not that I couldn't turn it on at home, but it, I just tend not to. And But I but I want to echo that last point Jen made, which is um, I try for it not to just be Washington, D.C., New York news, although I read the Post and the Times every day, but like get geographically diverse, whether you're down at this granular local news level or just at least geographically news. I mean, what the... What, the Atlanta paper is reporting and the LA paper and the Boise, Idaho paper are, you know, really, you can see where, you know, what the emphasis is. And I think that's really important and try to, um, and I also like Ravi sometimes try to consume, uh, or maybe not as often as he does consume things of opposing viewpoints to mine to make sure I'm, I'm testing myself and not becoming too biased. Um, I want to just also echo uh, the civic education point that I feel like it's not just in schools. Um, it's just like in general, we have got what some of the problems we're seeing with our media right now and the way people, it's not so much within the media, but the way people are reacting to uh, the media and, and even the way the government is reacting or not reacting is, I think, born out of a real kind of confusion about the, the limits of the First Amendment. I could say the same thing about the Second Amendment, but that's for another discussion. And Jen's heard me say some of that stuff before. But, um, you know, the First Amendment is not boundless, right? It does not prote- protect violence, incitement to imminent violence, incitement to imminent lawless activity. Yet the way you would hear speak, people speak about it in the United States suggests that anything goes. Now, unfortunately, you know, disinformation still, you know, is, has never been, except in certain areas, has never been clearly found unprotected. But when that disinformation is directed at causing harm, as Jen indicated, and causes that harm, that's a very different thing. The other point is that all everyone should understand, but far too many don't, is that you know, media platforms, social media, online media, cable media, those are private companies. They're not government run. And the First Amendment does not apply to them. They can take down whatever content they want based on their own terms of service, based on 
hate speech or whatever, even if it is protected under the First Amendment. It's only the government that can't direct that to the protected speech to be taken down. And so I think too often platforms want to pass the buck uh, to the government or pass the buck to the Constitution and say, we can't take this down, First Amendment. And that's just not that's just not the case. But even the government in considering regulation, I'm not su suggesting over-regulation because I do think it's very fraught and dangerous, but needs to really come to terms with what's protected and what's not. And too much right now, threats right now are, are rampant across social media uh, and, and even on, you know, in other forums, other media platforms that with very little response from the government or anyone else. That a really important piece of feedback there that whether it's our own Thanksgiving table or you're the world's big global platform, you're responsible for the information you allow in your own backyard. Uh, Mary, Ravi, Jen, thank you so much for all of those interesting contributions. It's now time to head to the next session.